May I call your attention, please? Now, we would like to focus our attention on this topic, which is the climate crisis and the extents of its impact on Asia. May I introduce to you the speaker, Attorney Antonio Gabriel Maestrado Lavina. He is a Filipino lawyer, educator, and environmental policy expert. Until 2019, he was chairman of Partnership Council, Partnership for the Environmental Management of East Asia. Attorney Lavina will speak for 20 minutes. May I call Attorney Lavina, Attorney Lavina to the podium. Thank you. Uh, I am doing this from the Philippines, actually from Mindanao, the island of Mindanao, Cagayan de Oro, where I am. I was here for meetings related to climate uh, justice. I apologize for not being able to go to uh, Thailand for this meeting and do this in person. My um, topic is the climate crisis and the extent of its impact on Asia. What must the church in Asia do to heal the universe? I think the right question is what must the church in Asia do to help everyone, everyone in the world, everyone in our region to heal the universe because the church will not be able to do this alone. It can do this only collectively with all churches, all religions, and all peoples of the world. Let me begin by to an update on the science of climate change. And we're lucky because the process is still going on. There's still a final report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But they've actually released already three of the working group assessments or reports, with only the final summary still pending. Actually soon it will be released, in time for the next meeting of the Climate Convention in Egypt in November 2022. Here are some of the findings that are important for us in Asia and the Pacific. And then I will actually then talk about its impact, how to Downgrade, download this to our region. What is the impact of climate change in our region? So the first message from the sixth assessment report of this uh, official science body of the United Nations on climate change is this. It is unequivocal there is no doubt that human influence has harmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cyrosphere, and biosphere have occurred. In other words, human beings have changed the world and have changed the world considerably and in a harmful way, as I'm sure in a while. Second finding from the sixth assessment report, global warming of 1.5 Celsius and 2.0 Celsius will be exceeded during this to say by 2030, we have to reduce emissions 45%. So that by 2050, we are no longer adding emissions, or we will do what's called net emissions, because there are also uh, uh, absorptions of emissions. By 2050, that's the goal. Otherwise, we will exceed. 1.5 and 2 degrees. And the consequence of that is terrible. 
global warming exceeds 1.5 Celsius, let's say by 2050, sometimes it already does that a day or for a week, but it's not yet the norm. But if it's the norm in 2014, 2050, many human and natural ecosystems will face additional severities compared to if you remain below 1.5 Celsius. These are called tipping points. If we continue to emit as much as we are emitting now, if we continue to warm the Earth as much as we are warming now, there will be many tipping points that will lead to severe impacts or of the world, especially up. Human induced climate change will mean more frequent attacks, extreme weather events, typhoons, droughts. It will cause widespread and adverse impacts to people, women, natural climate but not designed the world is not designed and the most vulnerable people system are the disproportionately poor countries and poor people most affected, even everyone. As I said, I am actually in the now I see the order of the bishop is there. And I was traveling yesterday from Bukidnon for actually sisters give briefing also on this. Going down, I will get one for the hours of the bus. The impact of public health will be serious and severe. More dengue, more malaria, even more dengue could be worse even than the coronavirus. And as I said, rising weather and climate is increasing death, massive present impacts, natural systems are being. What does this mean for Asia? For your areas, for your diocese, for your relatives? Well, in general, Asia is a large country, and it's part of coastal cities and towns of all other cities in the world. Which is a part of the If they return to sea level rise, Places that all cities find that it is a good Africa, but for they're all agriculture, fisheries, by the security, compromise, life, increase social conflict, increase social. So, Tony, can you stop your states Tony, can you stop your screen, your screen sharing and keep only the audio? Because not very clear. The audio is not clear. Ah, uh, the audio is okay. But stop the screen sharing. It's online. Uh, but the the PowerPoint. Is You only keep the PowerPoint and speak. Yeah, stop the video. Okay. But keep the PowerPoint. It's fine. 
can stop the video. Okay, I'll turn the video off. Okay. But will you see the PowerPoint? Yeah. Stop the video. Let me do that now. Uh, Is that okay? Can you see the PowerPoint? Much clearer. <laughs> okay, I'll proceed now. In Asia, Asia has more people, I said, in coastal cities than all other cities in the world combined. More people in coastal areas than all other continents in the world. So we will have more people threatened by climate change than all other continents all over the world. Let's be very clear about that. And agriculture, fisheries, and biodiversity will be severely affected, compromising livelihoods and increasing social conflict. And specifically in Asia and Oceania, our island states, and also small islands in bigger countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, even Malaysia, will be most at risk to climate change. Because of sea level rise, because of typhoons, we are even talking about the extinction of these island states, basically that you have to evacuate them. Or they'll be, not, they'll be in perennial flooding all, all, all year. South Asia, Bangladesh, Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan, we saw that just this week, in the last few weeks. Extreme increases in heat and humidity affecting workability and livability of sleep weather events. By 2050, in displaced countries, average temperatures are projected to rise by 2 to 4 degrees. Southeast Asia, a little bit better, but still very bad. Extreme, extreme increases also in heat and humidity by 2050 and extreme precipitation or rainfall events, typhoons. We are seeing that actually in the Philippines as well and all the different islands, the different countries in South Asia. North, Northeast Asia, Japan, and the Koreas will not be spared as well by typhoon and extreme precipitation events. The effect on water supply and drought actually will be main challenges in Northeast Asia. China, because of its geography, would experience all this range of impacts we talked about. Even Australia and New Zealand are the probably least affected with agriculture, possibly net beneficiary, are suffering droughts, floods, and forest fires. So the impacts all of the regions in Asia, the Pacific are really severe and serious. And time is running up for us. <clears throat> There's a tug of war between developed and developing countries in time to fix this problem. And the tug of war means we're running out of time to set back the clock at least so we can adapt better to climate change and not get to the world of 1.5 degrees and that is really what we prevent. Uh, even though the world is less than 1.5, our probably 1.2, 1.3 is already pretty challenging. But we cannot reverse that. But 1.5, we can stop getting. So now I'm down to my last two slides. Responses. Responses are key. We need to adapt. We need resilience. But we have to avoid what the scientists call maladaptation, the wrong way to adapt, which includes also the poor suffer adaptation measures by taking them away from where they live on the pretext that it's dangerous, but not putting them in better places. I think every country in the world is to mitigate and aim for low carbon economy versus a fossil fuel high efficient economy. Stopping total, 
all fossil fuel to, to power transportation systems. No more development pressure. Money is unsustainable. Forestry and land that is unsustainable. Plantation, deforestation by burning products. We need what's called nature-based solutions that emphasize biodiversity and food security. And I always emphasize the importance of respecting human rights of peoples when we make hard decisions about the climate emergency. The climate emergency should not be an excuse to further marginalize the poor especially people, farmers, local communities, women and children, people with disabilities and workers. So we always call for what's called a just transition for farmers, workers, people, and other marginalized sectors. They are already suffering the most of climate change. They should not suffer the most from our climate change measure. And globally, those of us who are involved in the our priority is putting in place laws and mechanisms at the international level so that there is support for people, countries, communities who suffer loss of life and damage to property because of climate change. That is now a discussion that is happening at the United Nations Framework Convention that met last ago, a year ago, and meeting shall in uh, Egypt in November, and meet, I think, in Dubai in our region next year. Of course, at the international level, that's not enough. We also have to do things at the local level, our families, our communities, the way we eat, the way we work, the way we use energy at home and work. That's important as well. And let me go now to my last point. It doesn't take rapid science for the church climate crisis. I think that the Apathy and the LPD are of enough points there. I will talk about that before you have a bit of a big stuff. But I would like to stress the threat of the church today. The truth is that we are still destroying the world. The truth is corporations and governments are still increasing the severity, the seriousness of climate change. So the church must have a perfect role to condemn that and to call for change, conversion, at the structural level. I think the church has a role today, as I said, to ensure that human rights and in particular intergenerational equity, justice, are the norms that we use to address climate change globally, nationally, and at all levels of just transition so an action point for the church so that people do not suffer as we expand the climate change. And then finally, in terms of doing things on the ground, a stewardship and leadership role is really important. Leadership role internationally through the Vatican. You know, the Vatican rarely becomes a part people of the But just a few, few months ago, the cabinet, the Vatican, has become a party as a nation state to the climate change of the And we welcome that. We hope the cabinet, the, the uh, 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 Vatican state will be an ally to developing countries and Generally, perhaps the FDP is to share the resources of the 
example, what we're doing not doing that. Uh, uh, that what we should do. At the municipal level, uh, uh, certainly, uh, bishops and ministers uh, that very strong pressure on different issues, pastoral statement as well as decisions like divestment or a very that you have to walk the talk to play a pragmatic role successfully. Sectorally, we have to push back on fossil fuel, coal, natural gas, hard gets out, oil, of course. Internally, we need to look at our own institutions. Are we supporting our world that is burning an economy that the world? Are we, are we investing in oil, in coal, in mining? Our education institutions, are we preparing our people for what's to come? And also preparing them for this time. And then, of course, at the local level, some practical things, station of infrastructure, the way we design, the way we design our churches, the way we design our schools, the education systems we have in schools. The schools we teach the people are highlight now that's a big thing there at the front. Unfortunately, they have been attacked by the government a lot these six years. So there are many things we can do I think it depends on the part of the but it's interesting. If we can help heal the world, help heal our region, not heal it by ourselves because we're not going to do it not succeed by ourselves. Yes. This is a all of the world, all of the global community approach to that. But certainly the church in Asia can contribute to having a Thank you very much. And that Attorney Andy Lavina, thank you so much for addressing us, giving us a scientific analysis. Most of us are laymen to that approach. With the dark picture that you have painted, you have also given us hope. Thank you so much. And you have called us to play our proper role of stewardship and leadership, and also called us to reread Laudato C. Thank you very much, Attorney Lavina. Thank you. Now let us spend two minutes in silence, in prayer. <coughs> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was the 
May I now introduce to you the second speaker on the same subject, Ms. Ridima Pandey from India. She is an environmentalist, environmental activist. She was also invited by the Holy Father, Pope Francis, for an environmental meeting that is featured in documentary, The Letter. Ms. Pandey will speak for 20 minutes. So, Adika, uh, your eminences, your excellencies, revered fathers, sisters, and guests. My name is Rudhama Pandey. I am 14 years old, and I am from India. I am from Uttarakhand. Uttarakhand is a part of the Himalayan region, and it is known for its natural beauty. The Holy River Ganga also flows there, but this treasure is now being polluted because of human activities like deforestation, disposal of wastes in the Ganges, and a lot more, and I believe that many of you present here might already know about that. My state has been impacted by cloud bursts, landslides, and flash floods, and flash floods are the reasons why I became an activist. I was five years old when uh, the Kedanath flash flood occurred in my home state, Uttarakhand. I was sitting at my house and I watched the destruction at the television. I watched kids crying that they lost their parents, that they lost their family members, that they can't find their homes and they don't know what next they're going to do. I also saw my father going there to rescue the animals. And somewhere seeing that destruction got so much into my head that I started having nightmares. Nightmares that I died because of a flood. I lost my parents, I lost my house, and I, don't really, I didn't really know what next I should do. After being impacted by these flash floods for a while, I decided that I wanted to do something because I didn't want it to die. So I asked my parents in terms of, what should I do about stopping the flash floods? I mean, what can I do to <laughs> it's okay. Um, and what can I do to stop flash floods because I didn't want it to die? And that's when I came to know about what climate change and global warming is. I got to know that because of our human emissions, the climate of the entire earth is changing. And my, I remember my parents telling me that I would be the one most impacted. India, just like Asia, is one of the most impacted places by climate change. But what, matter, what makes me even more anxious is that ones who are the most impacted ones because of this crisis are not the ones mainly responsible for this crisis. The kids of my generation are the ones most impacted by this crisis, today and in the near future. We are currently nowhere near on the track of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius or even 2 degrees Celsius. The current policies would lead to 2.7 degrees Celsius or even more warming at the end of the century. This is what the IPCC report says. Decision makers must do everything they can to limit the warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Every fraction of the degrees count. Every single fraction of degree matters to all of us. I filed a petition against the government of India in 2017 due to their inaction to complete the promises they made during the Paris Agreement and a failing in order to implement those decisions on ground. That petition was dismissed by the National Green Tribunal in 2019 after one and a half, after one and a half year on the grounds that the government was doing everything they can, but we all know that's not the reality, that's not the truth, because if government would have been doing everything, I wouldn't have been here talking about climate crisis and worrying about my future. And also in 2019, I filed a petition at United Nations under the Child Rights Committee to protect the child rights of kids all around the world, along with 15 other child petitioners. Unfortunately, 
uh, due to some technical issues, the UN couldn't take it forward, which has impacted the lives of many children around the world. Millions of kids around the world are dying because of climate change or are living my nightmares, and I don't want that. I don't want my generation to suffer. What has my done, generation done wrong to live in such a conditions when the older generation had a healthier life, had a healthier childhood? According to the UNICEF's report, one billion children are highly exposed to very high level of air pollution. And even within kids and people, you know what's the worst case? Is that climate change doesn't impact each and every person in the sim similar way or in the same way it does. The poor and the weaker communities are the ones bearing the brunt of our wrong deeds. Climate change is projected to increase the number of people experiencing extreme poverty from 32 million to 132 million by 2030. Over the last decade, the mortality from floods, droughts, and storms have been up to 15% higher in the most affected countries. The gap between the economic output of the world's richest and the poorest countries is 25% larger today than it would have been without global warming. We have to shift from gain maximization for a few to risk minimization for all. Now, when I say risk minimization for all, what I really mean is to get your help to address this crisis. We can follow the steps mentioned by Bishop Chiral just uh, in the earlier session just now. We need your help to provide a platform to the youth activists to present their views and to be heard. Now is the very first, the very first thing that would have came to my mind if I would have not been an activist would be why do kids become climate activists at the very first place? I mean, why is it important for us to be on the streets fighting for our rights? I believe it is because the older generation didn't took the lead and they didn't did their jobs properly. I was forced to be an activist because of the older generation forgot to respect the planet. I was forced to be out of my school and miss out on my childhood because I was scared that if I won't take action, I would die and my future would be destroyed. I am very fortunate enough that I got the chance to work as a cast member at the film The Letter, produced by Lidata C Movement and Off the Fence Production, whose trailer you'll be watching very soon. Um, and I had a private audience with His Holiness Pope Francis at the Vatican, representing the voice of the youth, along with the voices of the poor, the voices of the indigenous, and the voices of the wildlife. I still remember the day when we all were at the Vatican waiting for His Holiness to come, and to be honest, that was one of the amazing, yet one of the most nervous days of my life, because I was very scared to meet him. I, I mean, knowing that we were filming and knowing how important he was, I was very scared. But the moment he entered the room, I felt this very positive energy from him. And to be honest, I found him really cute and kind at the same time. Seeing him hear us made me heard as an activist, made me feel heard as an activist. And that's what we need. While we were filming the letter, I also learned about the encyclical Laudato Si. And I learned that in the encyclical, His Holiness has mentioned that we all have to come together to protect our common home, to protect this planet. In the letter, you'll see four different voices coming together and have a dialogue with Pope Francis to change the way we treat Mother Earth today. We hope that this film will help you bring the message of Laudate Si to different communities in your country so that they will be able to join Pope Francis in his fight to protect Mother Earth in the, uh, for the coming generations. Now, at the very end, me and the Laudate Si movement would like to invite you all for the special screening of the letter from Pope Francis to you today at 7.30 p.m. Now let's watch the trailer of the film that we will see this evening.
Thank you. Thank you so much. The Vatican releases Pope Francis' wildly anticipated encyclical on the environment. The nature is sacred. Tengam se. Tengam se. Protege climatic. A manque de la protection de la nature qui pose aujourd'hui de nos populations à quitter ces lieux. É perder a terra, a floresta. O grande agronegócio que está chegando aí. The marine heat waves are causing an unknown amount of death among corals. I want all the global leaders to do something to stop climate change because if it's not going to be stopped, it's going to harm our future. Queridos poetas sociales, porque ustedes son poetas sociales porque tienen la capacidad y el coraje de crear esperanza allí donde solo aparece descarte y exclusión. Je n'arrive pas à rester tranquille. Parfois, j'ai un esprit qui voyage. Le monde va mudar. Parce que ce qui était couvert, aujourd'hui, est découvert. Il faut lisser des liens très forts et il ne faut jamais rompre ce lien. Je suis ma hero, Ivan. Que personne de nous est uni seul. Nous avons tous les besoins les uns des autres. Try to be the change you want to see in the world. We arrived as individuals with very different stories, but we all shared a dream. Miss <clears throat> Bandy, young as you are, you have addressed the very important question of climate change. You have had the courage to ask the right questions from the older generation. You have been questioning the inactivity of the older generation. We pray that you may grow up as a climate change activist. You have the blessings of the Holy Father, Pope Francis, and you have also the blessing of all of us. Thank you. God bless you. May I invite Ms. Pandy to come up on the stage, please? Let us now pray in silence for two minutes.
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. 